For more than 20 years, filmmaker Joan Root had a life of romance and endless adventure, making documentaries with her daredevil husband about the wilds of the continent that she loved. Independence means a better life. And if that but it was a love that could not be sustained in an Africa that was changing. A love that would become dangerous when she tried to save a lake that came to define her whole world. Joan did not realize that this is a life and death question to people, to families, young, still hungry, wanting a life. She bailed him out of trouble. She paid people off to keep him out of trouble. And we don't know what hold he had on her or why. She knew she was trapped. She knew she was going down a pipeline. Uh, and she desperately wanted out, but she didn't know how. Whatever happened, whatever Joan did, whatever caused somebody to think that she deserved uh, what she got, I find that very difficult. ...to try to track the gunmen and are under pressure as this is the latest in a series of murders of white people... ...was an act of retaliation for her conservation work. The attack happened at a home near Lake Naivasha. Alan Root and his wife Joan are reckoned to be the best wildlife filmmakers in the business. Just watch them. Okay. Ready? Go! It was an, an endless adventure. She was great, very game, and didn't complain, and, and uh, loved it, knowing she did love it. We'd come down from the far end of Uganda, you know, Kadepo National Park, right up near the Sudan. And one day in Nairobi, turn around, and we'd be off to the Serengeti, or whatever I mean we're just non-stop what is it the roots have that makes them the a team well for a start they're obviously just that a team she was absolutely great I could come and say hey we're off to wherever and she'd say well, how long and I'd say oh about a month and uh, that would be it and the next thing I'd know she was filling the house with supplies and uh, and I'd have to pack him in the car and the trailer and, and off we'd go. Through the 1960s and 70s, Joan and Alan Root made nearly 40 groundbreaking documentaries capturing images of wildlife as never seen before, and opening the world's eyes to the wonders of their beloved Africa. Joan was born into the ruling class of colonial Kenya, the only child of an English settler. Her family had made a fortune first as coffee farmers and then as pioneers of the emerging safari business. Joan enjoyed a life of elite schools and endless safaris. When she returned to the colony after finishing school in Europe, her reputation preceded her. I'd heard about this girl, a lot of, lot of Guys were talking about her. Um, she'd been away to uh, school in Switzerland and had just come back and, uh, and caused quite a stir. She was definitely one of the, the most beautiful young women in, in Kenya at the time. I drove up in my battered old Jeep to a, a lodge in Ngorongoro Crater in Tanzania. And there was this big safari wagon covered in mud 
that just drove in with a big cage full of chickens on top. And out stepped this stunning girl in a sort of safari outfit. And uh, well, I was uh, instantly smitten. It was about a year later when we got married. The Roots spent their honeymoon filming in the bush. It was the beginning of a project to reveal to the world an Africa different from white hunters seeking the excitement of the kill. The Roots Africa was delicate, beautiful, pristine and complex. We saw nature holistically. We never made a film about a single species because that isn't the way they are. Everything is, is interconnected. There's so many subplots, if you like. She was incredibly observant. She would say, hey, you know, look at this. There's, there's something else going on here. And, uh, and we'd be able to incorporate that into the story. Joan and Alan were a complete unit. Um, Alan was the sort of genius and Joan was the sidekick. They knew how each other thought. Joan had got the, the right lens out almost before Alan asked for it. Both of them loved what they were doing. She knew exactly what was needed and she presented it. Anybody who, who saw films like that, it was new. Millions of people around the world watched The Roots films and now wanted to visit Africa. Discover it, the wild is where you find peace where you feel that nothing much has changed for the last 200,000 years. By the late 70s, more than 250,000 people a year were flying to Kenya. Within the world of wildlife and conservation, the roots were celebrities. Completed last year, the film was nominated for an Academy Award for Best With Feature extraordinary patience and ingenuity, her husband-wife team of naturalist photographers has succeeded in recording the nest. Joan organizes their trips and uses her vast knowledge of wildlife to contribute to their scripts. Though she looks fragile, her appearance is deceptive. We'd both wanted kids when we first got married had decided to, to put it off until we got established. And she just went along to have a check. And the doctor said, I'm sorry to tell you that you're having a premature menopause uh, symptoms and, uh, and I don't think you're going to be able to conceive. And, and sure enough, she couldn't. She was so successful in every other field and, and, uh, and, and couldn't, couldn't have children. You, you could see her pain. And she never really discussed that with me or with anyone. And so there was never a, ever a discussion about whether we should adopt. <coughs> um, it, it was just closed, closed subject. And, and she just internalized that, that pain and uh, she, she lived with that. Something that I learned later in life was that her parents had followed this strange doctor's idea of bringing up children, which was that if a child cried, you just let it cry. And then it knew that it, no help was coming and it would grow up knowing that it was on its own and independent and not yelling for help when it needed it. It was almost as though that upbringing had produced this, this behavior where you just didn't call out for help. Early in their marriage, Joan and Alan settled on the shores of Lake Naivasha, the only freshwater lake in Kenya, and known the world over for its extraordinary plant and wildlife. 
It was paradise, it really was. I mean, there were, there were just ranches around the edge. The land was spread out and full of wildlife, masses of wildlife coming down to drink in the lake. Full of hippos, vast areas of, of water lilies with um, thousands of water birds, unpolluted, clean. It was just incredible. We had a net about this long, which we had just waist deep out from the edge. You could walk out to unload the fish. And that provided us and our staff and our otters and our tame heron. You know, we, we got all the fish we needed from a six foot long net. Their lakeside home became a sanctuary for the menagerie of wounded animals they'd adopted and provided a break from the gruelling schedules that pulled them across the continent. We spent so much time together. We'd be in the vehicle from dawn to dusk just every day, every day. We, we often joked that, um, that we had sort of five years of togetherness for for every normal year of marriage. Um, and I think that, that actually got to us after a while. It wasn't something we could discuss, so it just didn't get discussed. And, uh, and if you don't talk about those kind of problems, they, they don't get solved. In 1983, after more than 20 years of marriage, Alan had an affair. But after three years of turmoil, they both agreed they wanted their old life back. A couple of days after I got back, Jenny, the lady I'd been with, was told she had leukemia and had probably two years to live. I, I felt that I couldn't abandon her. Um, and I think Joan felt, well, two years, you know, it's been eight months already, um, let's hang on. This is something Alan needs to do. And I felt I needed to do it. And, and so uh, there was just a, a tacit agreement that that's, that's what would happen, that I would stay with Jenny and, and that I'd be back. Jenny lived another 15 years. Joan was absolutely devastated. I mean, Alan was just the other part of her. There were two halves of a whole, as far as she was concerned. And she really was lost when it all broke up. Here you lose your whole life, really, as a business. You lose your vocation. You lose your best friend, you lose your partner, you lose your lover, you lose your husband, you lose everything in a very short period of time. How do you cope with that? Joan moved to live down here in Naivasha, which had been their home since 1960, but basically it was only a dumping ground between filming trips. She didn't know Naivasha. She didn't know the area. She didn't know the people. And suddenly she was a lonely woman sitting in this big, lonely house with her only friends, the animals around her.
Joan turned in on herself, a woman in her late 40s who'd lost her place in the world. For the better part of a decade, she spent much of her time tending to her land and feeding her animals, as the Africa around her changed. And Nelson Mandela walks to freedom, betraying only the hesitation that comes of a man thrust into the spotlight again after 27 years. The bridge of the Hutu exodus from Rwanda continues. Today, a constant stream of frightened people made the crossing to Zaire. They're fleeing what may be an to today. today. The scale of the crisis is evident. So is it the was the lake that gave her a renewed purpose. In the mid-90s, more than a decade after her split from Alan, she started noticing changes in its levels and the behavior patterns of the plant and wildlife that it sustained. The outside world, in the form of industry, could no longer be ignored. She loved nature. That was her life. She cared about the great infrastructure of nature and how it worked and, and how one small change in nature can have such a big chain reaction. She was looking at it from a, a complete ecological standpoint. Things were changing on that lake. She saw the effects of the lake going down and coming back up, the different algae that, that was produced, the different things that you would, would start growing at certain times of the year. And she was concerned about why the ecology of the lake was changing. It, it didn't surprise me when she started to concentrate on the lake because it's such a personal thing. You know, we had several hundred yards of, of lake frontage which had once been pristine and untouched, and the odd fisherman would go past in his canoe and wave. Um, and then suddenly she'd have 50 acres just down the road is covered in plastic. They were pumping water straight out of the lake. They were pollutants going back into the lake in the form of pesticides and fertilizer and so on. And so I think she had a very good case against them. And uh, once she took it up, I knew she'd be passionate and, and militant about it. There's a timeless feeling on this lake but things are changing here. The woods that once cloaked the surrounding hills have mostly been felled, and now the lake itself may be facing new threats from man. The threats come from the flower farms that have burgeoned on the shores of Naivasha, roses and carnations for the living rooms of Europe. The flower industry started more or less probably by accident in the late 70s with two companies, a Danish company called DCK and Osarian. Both these companies were really struggling like pioneers do and last minute they got it right and actually paved the way for the industry. On the back of these two companies many other entrepreneurs jumped on the bandwagon Infrastructure on the farms was developed, infrastructure in Nairobi was developed, the freighters started coming in and it sort of developed into a serious exporting business for this country, which at this point can be considered as probably one of the biggest success stories in sub-Saharan Africa. Walk into any supermarket, you'll notice the flower display is placed strategically near the door. We spend £750 million a year on cut flowers from supermarkets, and they deliver big profit margins. Flower growing is Kenya's big success story, fast catching up with coffee and tea as its top employer and a major export earner. The large farms employ anything up to 4,000 workers each. They come from all over the country to this mecca of employment. Most of these immigrants end up living in slums. Prior to the 1980s, it was just people living here. It was a small community. But once the flower industry started, that requires a lot of employees. And suddenly, Naivasha boomed and expanded big time. Uh, a lot of migrant workers have moved in, and with them come more people again, because there's a service industry as well for the people now who have a wage.
The problem is that the pressure around the edge of the lake from the horticultural industry and the people who work in the horticultural industry together are creating what scientists call eutrophication, which just means the lake is over-fertilised, over-fed, really. The algal growth gets thicker and it becomes a, a pea soup at times. The end species that thrive in the highest concentrations produce toxins and when they're in really, really high concentrations, the toxins that get out into the water are in a high enough concentration to cause damage to mammals. Joan saw that the increase of the development and the agricultural development and the industry around the lake was, was actually the prime um, if, um, cause of the changes on the lake. She was not afraid of standing up and, 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 and voicing her opinions. She wasn't afraid of standing up and actually implementing her opinions if she thought that they, were, they, 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 they would have an impact. Joan helped to persuade the flower farms to stop building on riparian land, the delicate band bordering the lake that is crucial to the local plant and wildlife. She joined a growing campaign to reduce their use of fertilizers and pesticides. And she drew attention to the millions of gallons they were siphoning weekly from the lake to water their product. Then she took on another, more sensitive issue. As people continued to flood into the area, desperate for work on the flower farms, they and their families needed to eat. They turned to the lake for free food. By 1998, Lake Naivasha was dangerously low on fish. The local department of fisheries was powerless in the face of this assault on the lake. Its enforcement staff consisted of just three men and a boat, often with no fuel to power it. With the department's support, Joan stepped in with a plan that went beyond the one-year fishing ban that was already being discussed. We were literally running out of fish. So it was agreed that the fishing on the lake should be shut down totally for a whole year. But of course it didn't stop the illegal poachers who were dragging their nets through the shallow waters, which is an illegal way of fishing, does a lot of harm to the submerged vegetation and takes out all the baby fish before they've had a chance to grow big enough to breed, which of course totally went against everything that Joan believed in. The poachers were unbelievably bold. You would see them on the riparian land of many of the flower farms, fishing with complete impunity because they no knew nobody was going to come and challenge them. Um, they were quite capable of being violent, quite capable of attacking anybody. So she went off and thought, well, what's the best way of dealing with this? Let's get poachers, turn them into gamekeepers. Good idea, good plan. Enter Mr. Cheggy. Mr. Cheggy was very, very plausible. He was a very, very intelligent young man. He was a great marketing man. He was a great communicator. And he got Joan's confidence. She put together with him a little task force that ranged from eight people to 15 people just to control and make sure that the fishing was protected um, so that you didn't overfish the lake. February the 3rd, 2001. Spoke with Chege. He came up with good points illustrating bad fishing methods. I spoke about my plan to patrol with 15 guys. Na zaidi poachers wa wanajua ziwa naivasha kabisa pamoja na fish na na fishermen. Kwa hivyo Hakuna kitu ingefanyika ya uongo kusema utatega alafu ujifiche. Lazima ungeatolewa mahali uliko umejificha. Nilichunga task force vizuri kawaida ya kiongozi. Hata mimi si kwa mpole. Nilikuwa mkali kwa kazi yangu. Next. 
19 3 and a half inch 3 1 3 and a half inch 3 ply 3 by 3 inch 2 ply 5 by 4 inch 2 ply 5 100 gram nylon ply 1 400 gram. For a while it did very very good work. The number of fine send nets that they managed to confiscate was unbelievable. There was always a mountain of them in her backyard. Chege and team pulled up about 40 2 by 2 and a half 2 ply nets. Long talks with Chege about their operation. Yesterday they went to Kapongi where they burnt 10 boats and caught three poachers. <laughs> sababu sasa unaona amezuia huyo mtu akujatake samaki ameniweka mimi pale niangalie huyo mtu asikuje kutenga samaki lazima wangalie darao na sasa hii ziwa tusebe inasaidia kwa njia nyingi sababu hata huyo mkuzaji maua si anaitegemea ule mwenye anakuja kutenga samaki hapo anaitegemea huyo mwenye anakuja anakata hizi vitu anaenda kufanya kazi yake si anaitegemea lakini sasa ule ako pale ameizuia There is no Swahili word for poachers. It's a colonial word. It's bad. It's evil. Any poacher is something that has to be eliminated. And poachers do not know where to put themselves because they're not evil people. They're ordinary people just trying to make a living. They don't see anywhere they've wronged. They've not gone to steal. They've not gone to kill anybody. They're not even stealing nets. They've only gone to fish, God -given, in a God-given lake. Naivasha Fisheries Report, two years leading up to April 2003. Improved sizes of fish leading to partial lift. General improvement on shoreline ecology, which forms fish. Confiscation of over 3,000 illegal fishing nets and more than 60 arrests of over 400 suspects. The poachers Joan was trying to eliminate were like most of the 350,000 people living in the slums that now surrounded the lake. Only one in ten had found employment on the farms. The rest scraped out livings as best they could. The flour industry is directly responsible for the slums. I'm not talking necessarily every flour farm, but the flour industry in Navasha, I think one could say, must be responsible for the slums. Firstly, because their workers come from there, because they're not housed on site. And secondly, because they have indirectly encouraged the massive growth of satellite industries and migration of people into this area who weren't here before, who have come to look for jobs or to be supported by the one or two of their family who have jobs on the flower farms. Where do these people get their firewood? Where do they get their charcoal for cooking? Where do they get, uh, uh, where do they get their meat? A family uh, of five uses one bag of charcoal a month. Now there is 60,000 assholes around Naivasha. Where do they get their charcoal? It has to come from the catchment. Is there any trees specifically planted to be able to meet the charcoal demand so that it can help counter the deforestation of the catchment? No. Joan knew that the disappearing fish were just part of the larger environmental destruction of Naivasha. What she didn't know, or perhaps chose not to acknowledge, was that the fish the poachers didn't eat, they sold on to middlemen, who were part of a criminal industry that stretched all the way to the capital of Nairobi. <laughs> I did worry about her. Where food is concerned, it's a pretty, pretty big issue in this country, especially if you're white, especially when you've got enough food and there's people, you know, around the place that are all looking for the cheapest source of protein they can get. I suppose a lot of people were making a lot of money from those undersized fish. There's a consumer, there's a buyer, there's a wholesaler. So if they're not getting, if she's making it difficult for these tiny fish to be sold, then that's, that's very much infringing on their business. But if Joan knew, she didn't let it stop her. 
She had bankrolled the task force for four years now and watched with mounting excitement as the fish returned to the lake in healthy, marketable sizes. The fishermen were relieved because they were back to earning a living. The community was happy. There were now plenty of fish to buy at market. To celebrate, she and the fisheries department held a public burning of the thousands of nets they'd confiscated. Joan's mission was succeeding. The task force filled a big empty space. She was part of a gang in a way. You know, I think it was, you know, quite exciting. She was able to achieve something. Every day she, she had to get up and do something that was quite compelling. But as time went on, questions were starting to be raised about the motives and methods of the man Joan had put in charge. Hata kidogo, hakuna hata kidogo kitu kama hiyo. Hiyo ni fitina ya watu. Na watu wale wanataka kuharibu jina yangu. Ndani ya hao ni wale ambaye ni kuna kataza wapate mapato kwa leo. Chege grew up in the slums, in that young, changing Kenya with limited opportunities. John grew up with almost what you will say, unlimited opportunities. And then went to pursue wildlife photography and wildlife conservation, which in itself is almost a different class from the realities of what our Kenya is, a changing country. A new generation coming angry, wanting to be able to take also opportunities. Joan, she wanted to preserve the lake as natural, pristine as she's seen it in her lifetime. To Chagi, here is a way, a vehicle, to make all the money I want. What is conservation? Well, I don't think Chagi really understood what conservation really is. From a poacher, who was humble and trying to sell his fish, given the power, he became an absolute dictator with the total power to crush things. He realized within no time that I am the man, I have the power, and he used those powers brutally. Pochas were called to me a panga, Michare, M. Narungu, Vitu Kubo Kubo, Kwaki Kisha, or Mepiga Task Force. Quaivo, Night Task Force, Wawanga, and a pare, Kwa Urahizi, Kushika, Wale Pochas. They fight, you've got to retaliate, haven't you? and retaliation is arresting someone with the minimum amount of force necessary, which you can do, but sometimes you, you know, you, you go too far. One is able to go too far. They were the force. They were the law. There was no need for court, they were the court. So they had the right to beat you up, they had the right to humiliate you as much as they want and inflict any uh, fee they deem fit. 
within their time. But to the local realities, we want food. The task force did not realize that this is a life and death question. They have to feed their families. They have to have a living. By early 2004, a war had broken out on the lake, with both sides resorting to increasingly desperate measures. Then an incident involving a young poacher named Joseph Ajare changed everything. Chieng no ero, no wok bokini, ko de na. Koro odi tish, ni kishka pile kan odi gatish to duo go diambo. Ko kelo rech go eko, tan manaja ka rech ta timona da oso. Koro ko di go kini chieng no ta bodo ka pok no duo go duo go go e dawat. Koro le ngo linga gigo diambo, ta wa yudo report ni oro mugi jo tax force ko anam nto jogo otemo make. I go to the hospital and I find Ojare there to the hospital, crying, serious crying. Told me, Andrew, I was beaten serious. I was beaten my whole body. By who? He told me, Mr. Chege, and all of tax force. Chege, ya kupiga wat. Tafauti na regu la Joe and Root. Regu ya Joe and Root, tukiwa katika zile tax force ya ristuereza, usipige mutu. Umunyaganye neti yake, na umunyaganye samaki zake. Na pia mpereke polisi kama unapeda, lakini kupiga rikuwa mekata. There was no evidence that Chege had been personally responsible for the assault. But as rumors spread through the slums, human rights organizations began to scrutinize the case. The task force was facing a public relations disaster. Gemma and Chege know if this man is here, they will be prosecuted because human rights they will follow this channel up to police commissioner. So they know this is a serious case. So what we have to do, we have to take this man away. And they go to the hospital and tell the man, live about human life. They cannot help you. They cannot give you money. You live about them. We want to give you 50,000 and hide you away from Naivasha. Ajari returned to his village. Several weeks later, he died from complications from surgery to repair his broken leg. In that story, the man was in the hospital and you or Chegi paid for him to go home because this was going to become a, an issue for the task force. Is that true? Correct. And, but Joan paid, not me. What, and, what, oh, and, what, and what, what exactly did she do, Joan? I think through Chegi, they went and paid the hospital bill and got the man out and gave him enough money to get home. And their reasoning was? There was going to be more trouble had he remained here with a broken leg and everyone could point a finger at the task force. So, so, so Joan actually paid? Joan paid. Was Joan that? paid a lot of money on things like that and I'm sure she paid a lot that I didn't know about and never got to know about. <laughs> Thank you.
News of Ajari's death spread around the lake. The task force and anyone associated with it were now perceived to have blood on their hands. Ajari's death was part of a changing Naivasha. By early 2005, the area had become a hotbed of violent crime. Rapes, carjackings and armed robberies were common. Whites and blacks alike were being murdered, sometimes for as little as $50 or a mobile phone. Yet people kept coming, lured by the dream of getting some of the runoff from the riches of the flower industry. The industry was now a global player, one of the top three flower producers in the world. Over 20,000 employees and their families are dependent on the flower growing companies around Lake Navasha. We're flying into uh, USA, Canada, a lot of countries from France, Belgium, uh, Italy, Russia, Far East, a little bit into Japan, Poland, Scandinavian countries. It's extremely important to Kenya economically. It's an industry of which we're very proud. We're trying to do our best. And we What's happened here in Naivasha is a form of industrial progress. Industrial progress demands compromise. To the eye, if you come here into Naivasha, coming from the escarpment, and you see these um, acres and acres and acres of plastic, yeah, of course, it, it looks different than, than, than 30, 35 years ago where there was no plastic and no shanty towns and no everything, and it was absolutely pristine. I could run down a one and a half hour list of projects which have been done by the private sector around Lake Naivasha, to, which is actually not our responsibility. Schools are not our responsibility, roads are not our responsibility, hospitals are not our responsibility, at the end of the day, half the schools wouldn't be here if there wouldn't be flower farms, and half the hospitals wouldn't be here if there wouldn't be flower farms. The huge number of flower farms in Navasha at the moment is unsustainable. It is going to kill the lake. Because the flower has to be fed. It has to have that constant water to meet the market dates and to meet the required production standards. A rose is 70% water and it's flown all over the world every single day, 365 days, constantly. That is Naivasha water pumped out of the area and flown all over the world every single day. Joan was very realistic and realized that this was just part of the way it was going. Development was the human way of life. Because of the encroachment of the, 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 the farms, the, the greenhouses, the development, and all the rest of it, um, she really felt that there should be a last, you know, some, some place that was in its natural, untouched, virgin state. She wanted her lands to be an example to others of what this area used to be like. And I think her passion for what she did here was a silent protest.
In May 2005, John Sutton, a security consultant hired by Naivasha landowners to reduce crime around the lake, rented the cottage adjoining Joan's house. He was immediately struck by Joan's connection to her land. You could see that it was very much part of her being, her existence. She was like part of it. It's almost like she had roots in the ground, you know, when she was moving her steps and everything. It was like just part of it. She would stand still and the mongooses would be around her and wild animals, but they weren't afraid. I was fascinated by this uh, connection to nature. And something I'd never ever experienced or seen in my life before. Amazing. Um, she, was, she was really in tune. It wasn't long before Sutton discovered that not everything was as harmonious as it seemed. Joan had a stone sign that had JR written and painted on it. I started finding that stone in different places. I found it upside down, I'd found it in the tree. Um, I found it with uh, what looked like blood had been poured on it. Sometimes I'd come to the second gate and there was a chicken, not stuffed, it'd been put with straw on the gate. I was worried because witchcraft in this part of the world is serious stuff. When I confronted Joan about this situation, she told me it'd been going on for quite some time. And uh, she explained that it was a neighbor thing and that it was actually a personal feud. I said, okay, but perhaps we should get the neighbor over to come and talk and maybe we find out what's, oh, no, 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 I can't. She won't come and talk to me. She hates me. I said, what do you mean she hates you? Oh yes, she hates me and that's another story. For as long as Joan had lived in Naivasha, Diana Bunny had been her neighbor. Like Joan, she'd been born into the colonial world. Her grandparents had arrived as missionaries early in the century, and her father had been the local doctor for 40 years. She, too, had a clear vision for her land. It was a place of peace, um, comfort, joy and encouragement and hope. We felt it was God's property. When you come here, you feel God's presence here. It's different. You feel the love and care. That's what people have said. And they've loved coming, and it's so warm and welcoming. So that's the reputation it has had. <laughs> Since inheriting the 22-acre plot from her parents, Diana, a single woman, had struggled to make ends meet. For Joan, Diana's hardship presented an opportunity. Joan wanted that land for the animals. She wanted to leave it as it is, clean, wild, for the animals which are lucky enough to get in there, to be there and, and be safe in there. And uh, I think she was very worried that one day Diana would leave this to a church group, and it was all be sold for development in some way that Joan wouldn't have liked. She told me that they were the best of friends. And they were the best of friends until such time as she'd made a bid and she wanted to buy that property. And since then, that was it. They were absolute enemies. I have been very distressed and deeply hurt since I received your letter. I should be careful before throwing out false accusations. I too am heartily sick of incidents that have happened. It is very upsetting when what I do or say is misconstrued. Please let me know what this No is one can underestimate God's power. And as I have told many people, this is God's property. We were very friendly uh, with her, invited her over, but 
behind one's back, the terrible thing she said was um, not true and trying to just get us out, really. It was all quite a dangerous game. Sutton discovered that the feud with her neighbour wasn't the only intrigue in Joan's life. By now, Joan had downscaled the task force to Chege and four others, whose only job was to patrol her lakefront. Yet former members were still coming and going. Joan was known to be generous, but Sutton sensed that these men weren't looking for new jobs or handouts. One evening, when Joan shared an ominous text message with him, he got a glimpse of the complicated web in which she was caught. I asked Joan, what did this mean? And she said, well, what this is, is members of the task force who are protecting me against illegal fishermen who we had apprehended during the time of the task force who now want to come and do me in. I asked her, how do you know it's happening? Well, I don't know, she said. I'm being told this by my, my main guy because I trust him. He's, he's protecting me. He's the only person that's protecting me from all these situations. I became very concerned. I didn't understand this relationship. I didn't understand where the levels of loyalty lay and so on. And there were too many contradictions at that time. There was not, there were things were not adding up. It was, it, 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 things were not right. Sutton now feared for Joan's very safety. Then he found out something that made him worry even more. Four months earlier, Joan had been carjacked as she drove home from the bank with the staff's wages. The gang had slapped her around and stolen her phone and cash. Some of her friends were suspicious that Chege had been involved, a charge he'd vigorously denied and for which the police had found no evidence. Joan's faith in him had never wavered. Chege really had her confidence. She liked him, she respected him, she thought, she really, really thought that he had integrity. She really thought that he, he, he was there for the reasons that she was there. In actual fact, he wasn't. It was very personal. I, I don't suspect they were necessarily having a relationship, a physical relationship, but certainly spiritually they were so entwined that she was wrapped in that, and he was very much the focal point. Dash to meet Chege, to give him 22,000 shillings. Chege phoned. Last night, they ambushed at Bushy Way Island. Until Three of them were attacked by 18 men. Chege wrote me a letter six. wanting to buy a small motorbike. Chege came to tell me latest shillings. intrigues from fisheries. I told Chege to send Mwara to Kameri tomorrow as a spy. Chege came, Chege with the and we discussed Saturday and Sunday operations. The more I questioned, the more I realized how wrapped up Joan was in this whole security situation. It had become a way of life. It had entrapped her completely and it was almost like it, she was on a it was like a drug for her the intrigue the mystique the the cloak and dagger kind of scenarios it was an alternative existence to the outside world it was a life where she was in charge she was in control where she was able to take care of herself. And this way, I think going back to perhaps the start of all that was the breakdown of, of when she departed from her previous marriage. She talked about Alan quite a lot. He was still, in a funny way, a part of, part of her life in that he was very much presence in the house. 
The sitting room had the same covers on the sofas and the books on the shelves. The dining room had stayed the same way. Though she wanted to change the house, she couldn't bear to take away a lot of the memories. She told me on several occasions that Alan was the only person that she was able to share and experience nature in the way that she loved to do it. There was nobody that she could walk around in the bush with and they would both notice and be interested in exactly the same things. She really, really missed that. She really missed being with him. And um, I think she also always thought they'd be together again. And she came over one evening with a letter that I think he'd written to quite a few friends. She read the letter to me with tears in her eyes. It was a realization that they weren't gonna to be together again. And the letter was basically saying that he'd, he'd met Fran and they were going to have a baby together. And I suppose that was the end of a, a dream and a hope that she'd had. Long talk with John about the task force. He advised me to completely close down, get rid of Chege and all five of them. At night, stayed awake, worrying what to do about Chege. For weeks, a member of Joan's house staff had been stealing money from her bedroom. When she discovered that the thief had a close connection to Chege, she finally accepted that he had to go. I said to Joan, remember the laws of the land, the perception of the laws of the land. You're going to have to pay him off. And I said, when you do pay him off, you better be generous because you don't want anybody coming back in the back door saying that you didn't see me right. You better be generous with him. Joan reached a settlement with Chege and found him a job in Western Kenya. He and his family left Naivasha. Two weeks later, Sutton had a rude awakening. I heard this shouting. I stuck my head out to see what was going on, and I saw somebody running up, and he was shouting and shouting, Mama has been taken. Mama has been taken. I thought, oh my God, Joan's been attacked. She's been abducted and she's been taken down to the lake. I fired two shots into the air. Within a couple of seconds after firing the two shots, um, I heard another replying shot. I rushed downstairs, and as I got to the door, my phone rang. It was Joan saying, um, I'm OK, I'm OK. And I said, Joan, where are you? She said, I'm in the staff quarters. She managed to escape out the back door. They had broken into the house. The fact that they had gone through some drawers in the office suggests that there were some documents that they were looking for. I do know that Joan had been keeping some title deeds of land uh, whilst the staff were repaying the loan. Joan had bought property for some of her staff, including Chege. I don't think she chose to read clearly the signs. Too proud, too sucked into the energy of being in, in, in her home, on her land. Perhaps had lost sight of 
the fact that life would go on on her lawn without her, perhaps scared to move, perhaps, I don't know. It wasn't, it wasn't, she shouldn't have stayed. I would say to her, Joan, you need to go on holiday. Just go on holiday. Just tell everybody you're old, you're tired, you need a break. Just tell everybody. And don't tell them when you're going. Just one day, then you're not there. I was trying to get her away out of the environment because the environment was getting to the point whereby it was threatening her security seriously. It really was threatening her security. I'd been going to her house once a week for a few months, and I'd never been invited in, not even onto the veranda. Well, after her murder, I find all the security she's putting in the house, I knew nothing about it. I believe she kept me out of the house because she didn't want me to find out that she was going to that extent of putting security in to save her life. And I think she must have been very worried about something. Chege and Esther back in Karagita. Chege trying to get a job through Barry. Barry being informed. Very stressed PM. John phoned to say he'd rushed to Nairobi for emergency. Then power cut. No supper cooked. At night felt insecure. So soon after break-in and John away. As 2005 drew to a close, Sutton was often away on business across the continent. Joan was increasingly alone in her house. On the night of January the 12th, 2006, Sutton was 400 miles away in Tanzania. It was about, about midnight when I got the first phone call. Joan said, they're back, they're here. I couldn't understand what she was going and then I heard the siren going again and I knew that intruders had come into the house. She said they're trying to get in through my bedroom door. I told her to get down and go to the bathroom. Get down, go to the bathroom, stay put. I'll call for help. I called the police. I called people and said that there was a, an attack taking place at Joan Root's premises. I then had another phone call within, I don't know, a minute, not even, perhaps, can't remember exactly. And Joan was now talking to me. I could hear people shouting for her to open the door to let them in. She was sobbing and, and just kept calling out my name. And I could hear this banging going on. And I thought that they were using like a sledgehammer to bash the metal door down. But I knew that as long as those doors held, they wouldn't get in. She was obviously very afraid, um, but she wasn't hysterical. She was just kind of sobbing and she was like out of breath. Um, she was obviously in shock. Um, she was afraid. And um, her voice got lower and lower. I thought she was talking, just quietly talking, um, just so that they wouldn't hear her. But like she didn't want to disconnect because she wanted to just to talk, like she wanted to hear somebody's voice or something, I don't know. And I was just reassuring her. Her voice just 
faded away and it just got quiet and quiet and then quiet and then, and then stopped. I heard a few more bangs. I disconnected the phone. I called again the cops and said, for God's sakes, you're running out of time. Get there before they get in. They arrived at the house. They said the lights are off, um, but we can see inside. And there's a, there's a huge, you know, sort of marks of blood on the floor and it's leading into what looks like the bathroom. I tried calling her back. They said, no, we can hear the phone ringing in the bathroom. I knew that, I knew what had happened. They found Joan in the bathroom, lying on her side, holding the phone next to her. Her sobbing and everything, she'd obviously been hit. Her voice fading away, that was her last breath of life. And I was sitting in a hotel, hundreds of miles away. Couldn't do anything. Couldn't do anything for her. Well, that was the first time I'd been back for 15 years. Um, and, you know, outside was, was just the same, just the fabulous views, the, the peace, the, the animals and birds. They all came out to say hello. And, and then the scene inside, just of the sort of fortress that she'd turned the place into. Um, and then the, you know, the, the bullets stuck in the furniture and the, the blood everywhere and just such a contrast. The police were all there and, and they were introduced to me and knew who I was uh, and so uh, within a very short time uh, they opened the house to us, which was actually quite strange to me because I would have thought that they would still be there trying to, to, to find what they needed to find or what forensics need to be done and so on. We found several bullets in there, in the mattress and places like that, which I thought they would have already done during the night, um, but they didn't. We think that they came straight round the back of the house directly to her bedroom window. I'm convinced it was a, a, a contract murder. I'm convinced of that, absolutely convinced of it. Police in Kenya are hunting the killers of a British filmmaker, Joan Root. She was shot in what friends suspect was an act of retaliation for her conservation work. The 69-year-old filmmaker and naturalist was shot in the early hours of this morning at the farmhouse in Naivasha. They tried to break the door. And finally, they catch up with her in the bedroom, whereby they fired seven rounds of ammunition from supposedly an AK-47. Police are using dogs to try to track the gunmen and are under pressure as this is the latest in a series of murders of white people in the Naivasha region. Friends believe her stand against poachers cost her her life. She was involved in dangerous ground in wherever you are trying to regulate an unregulated market or, or impact on illegal activities, you're, you're under threat. 
So my first feeling was, of course, that perhaps this was in some way the illegal fisherman getting back at her. Immediately, I thought Shaggy would probably be, have been involved. There were too many of Shaggy's family involved with Joan, with either loans or title deeds or one thing or another. They, they thought they would be better off with her out of the way. Joan's murder was the most high-profile case in years and the police were under enormous pressure from the white community to find her killers. Within 24 hours, a tracker dog identified three men from the slums. The next day, Chege was also taken into custody. While we are here to celebrate Joan's life and the many benefits it bestowed upon us, let us not allow a celebration that she lived become cover or concealment the way she died. I can't imagine anything more terrifying for anyone at two o'clock in the morning to have that happening. And, and, uh, and you know, I wish to God she'd have collected one in the head and, and gone down. But instead of that, she, she fought back and dragged herself into the bathroom Joan was compassionate, to the point of being a soft touch. Nowhere is this more evidence than in the loans and help she offered, not just to her own people, but others too. Indeed, it may have contributed to her fate. I can't imagine that she screamed. I, I honestly can't imagine that she screamed. And if for whatever reason you need to be forgiven by Joan, let that forgiveness come now and let go of any hurt. When I came up to talk, the, the Crown Cranes, who I just have a way with, because I've always had cranes, them came and danced around me. Uh, that was just all so moving. Everything we did back in those years together, she made possible. She was my right arm. She was the wind beneath my wings. <laughs> and, and if we flew high and far in those days, it was because of her. Lots of tears. And then it rained. And you, know, you can't have anything better in Kenya at a funeral or a wedding than, than for it to rain, because it was dry as hell and they needed rain. And it was, uh, you know, a lot of people said, hey, she's up there and, and stirring it up already. <laughs> Chege and the three other suspects languished in prison for more than a year before their case was finally heard. The judge found them innocent, citing no evidence. Chege and the others walked free. Kwa sababu nilikuwa close sana na na Joan. Joan alikuwa amenichukua kuwa kama mtoto wake wa karibu. Na Watu walifikiri labda labda wakati nimetoka ni uhusiano wangu uliokuwa mbaya lakini haukuwa mbaya kati yangu na John. Singeweza ama hakuna siku hata moja ningekuwa ning, eh, na mawazo ya kufikiria eh, kufanya kitu mbaya yoyote kuhusu John ama shamba ya John ama ki, kitu yote inahusika kwa karibu na yeye.
splash just doesn't work. A sort of politically correct term, I think, is poor governance. But poor is a, is a pretty mild term for to describe the sort of intellectually impoverished kleptocracy that, that run this place. There was no way that there was going to be a proper trial and proper evidence. That Barry Gamer and I found half the bullets in the room that the police hadn't bothered to, to look for even. The investigations that the police did were below par. The evidence was gathered in, very, very, in a very shallow manner. Other than the shoes that were recovered from the suspect, there was nothing of worth from the exhibits that were taken from the scene. Why? There was a lot of interference from the white community here. I do think the interference started from the scene of the crime. The way things were being done by locusts and the other members of the community who were living there showed that there is something they wanted to conceal. The story was far from over. Nearly a year and a half after Joan's death, the circumstances surrounding it were once again the subject of speculation. Her former neighbor, Diana Bunny, stood in the dock of the Naivasha courtroom. She and her cook, James Ombui, were charged with conspiracy to murder a former tenant of Diana, Brian Freeman. For some people around the lake, the near-fatal attack on Freeman had disturbing echoes. I had no idea who had murdered Jane at the time of her death. But Naivasha being a small community, of course, everybody talks, and it soon became sort of common belief that Cheggy had, that Cheggy had done it, and nobody really thought further than that. It was only after the attempt on Mr. Freeman's life that I and a few other people started to wonder whether there wasn't a similarity or a connection between his attempted murder and Joan's actual murder. Initially, when we moved in, it was a very sound relationship, but we'd only been in the property six months and the water was turned off. She said we hadn't been paying our bills, when in fact we'd been paying the agent. And then it escalated. The dog was poisoned. Uh, we had a whole lot of chickens. They were thrown over the fence with broken legs. We came across this mound of earth that had just been dug. Looked in and there was this red pot. And we know James is a Kesey man. We know that the Keseys are well known for their witchcraft. We call it juju. So uh, I immediately became suspicious. Why was it laid in the middle of the road, our road? Freeman barely survived the assault. A bullet from an AK-47, the same model used in Jones' attack, shattered his left arm. The gun had misfired when pointed at his head. There's no doubt in my mind the person behind the attack was Diana and James. Uh, I've since seen police statements where they've admitted that uh, they had meetings with a Mr. Fixit, who subsequently got the gang together and in fact stayed with them for three or four days before the attack took place. She paid. So it was a contract really put on my life by them. And I think the reason why was to get rid of me from the property. I had shown an interest. I've since learned, because I showed that interest in buying the property, that uh, they no longer wanted me to stay. Someone told me that you confessed that you'd written some statement. Um, there was, I think it was under I just wasn't myself at all, and I don't even know what I'd... 
I was forced to uh, write things that I didn't even know I was writing. But admittedly, there were probably some weak points. I hadn't a clue what I wrote. I wasn't in my right mind. And I half wondered if that was um, witchcraft, because you really don't know what, what you're um, doing. Were you behind the Freeman attack? Oh, no, no. I could never, never do that. The only weak part was that some of the gangsters were on the property and I didn't know at the time they were occasionally, there was a room we let visitors go into, James's visitors, as I thought at the time, but um, they were just a couple of them and I didn't know it at the time, which is terrible. But other than that, I'd never <laughs> dream of doing anything like that. Brian Freeman and his wife Esther had been living in Naivasha for only two months when Joan was killed. Esther had been on their property the morning after the attack and later told her husband what she'd seen and heard. She said that Diana Bunny and James came across the fence. James was talking to the staff, telling them what he had learnt about the murder. Diana immediately came up to Esther and said, that evil woman is now dead. She's lying down dead. Thank God for that. She's no longer here. Words to that effect, which surprised Esther very much. Not only did she say it, but she gestured as if, you know, she was really pleased about it. Her ongoing feud with Joan had made Diana feel her very physical safety was at risk. Do you think Joan was literally trying to get rid of you? Yes, she was, yes. In what way? I don't know how she would have done it, but she was out for doing it, probably with her task force. Who knows? <laughs> you mean to, to kill you? Yes, yes. There's also a rumor, and I, and I feel I have to ask you this, James, that because of your struggles with Joan Ruth, that you might have been behind her attack. Um, I suppose one's been gradually broken in over the years because some terrible things have been said and which aren't true. But it does hurt, and but um, it breaks one's heart really to think people can think that way, especially in the crime sort of way. That really does hurt <laughs> because I'd never. I wouldn't, I wouldn't even dream of even thinking about it. In late 2009, Diana Bunny was acquitted of all charges relating to the attack on Freeman. All people like Joan who put their head up and survive or put their head up and don't survive, they do make an impact. We've progressed probably in the last 20 years or so in, from people like Joan being seen as cranks, only interested in butterflies and birds, to people who actually understand the fact this planet as we know it at the moment is the only planet we know which is habitable.
whatever anybody says now, they will remember the contribution that Joan Rood made, creating an awareness of, of, of the environmental issues around Lake Navasha. Joan Root started that. Joan Root was the one that actually put that in place. From my perspective, I have a different sort of legacy of which I will consider Joan. And it is this way. He was Joan with an idea and ideal to try and conserve the lake. This task force thing took her out of the closet into an entirely different, almost, universe to which she had no idea how it works, how it operates, what difficulties and challenges, plus expectations he had. As an Ivashan, as someone who grew up here, what she funded is a brutal force. So it's a legacy of a bit of pain and suffering and a rich person there telling us how to live and that they live and have everything and we're only trying to make a living. And she even funds some of the people that we know to suppress us, to deny us the chance just to, a chance for livelihood. Joan was a through and through conservationist. If there's progress, wherever the progress is, there's always certain sectors or certain elements we won't be happy about the progress. So here it is the it is the it is on one hand a very strong commercial economical progress, which is to a certain degree um, in conflict with the environment. I guess her life, really, and her life story was a um, microcosm of of what is happening to to the not just to Kenya and Africa, but to the, to the rest of the world. Um, that um, in the name of progress, we are we're destroying so much of value. It's terrifying. It's the speed at which wildness is disappearing everywhere around the world. Um, it's all getting paved over and turned into shopping malls and flower farms and you name it. I, I really am thankful that, that I have two little boys and, uh, and have to hope that, that the world is going to at least be livable for them, although it's going to be nothing like the world I knew. <laughs> 